So, again, welcome to the uh, first Grace Communion Seminary graduation celebration. Uh, it is our plan to have one of these at each of the international conferences, so we look forward, even as we celebrate today, to look to uh, probably twice as many graduating in three years. But first, tonight, we are here to celebrate and to join these seven students, actually eight, are graduating, one couldn't be here because he's in Singapore or someplace on a mission trip uh, and couldn't be here, but we do have seven who are here and their families. And a comment on the silly costumes. We, we call them regalia, but others call them silly costumes. <laughs> but as we reflect on, on our history, and we look ahead, we might just note the meaning of the cap. The cap referred to the freedom that was gained by the slaves. They were typically given a cap to celebrate their freedom, represented in the knowledge and understanding and what God has given us, being in the image of God, the ability to think, to think on Him, to know Him, and to live, on, live in Him. So we want to start this evening with a recognition of the mates and the families who have supported the graduates for so many years in the course of their, their work. Some have had to work harder than others, so if Sandy can come forward. Uh, I have asked one of the, uh, the wives of the graduates, uh, perhaps one wife that may have had to work harder than others, I don't know, Mike. <laughs> But for the opening prayer, if you'll please stand. Sandy Swaggerty. I would like to pray for the graduation today, and I'd ask all of you to pray with me. Father God, we come to the, this beautiful ceremony. All of these people have worked so hard to get this diploma. Father, I thank you for the fact that we've got through the accreditation. It took us three years to do that. But all of these men had wonderful teachers and wonderful faculty to help them in every step of the way. We just ask you to bless this graduation service and just thank you for all the hard work that the students did to prepare for this. In Christ's name I pray, amen. It takes a lot of work over several years uh, to put together the seminary, courses for the seminary, the work towards accreditation, uh, many documents that had to be uh, worked and reworked, syllabi that we required of the faculty, and of course a lot of work on the part of the students uh, to, uh, to meet those requirements. We do want at this point to recognize the board members, if the board members and the faculty of Grace Communion Seminary would please stand. I want to thank you all, if we can all thank them for the hard work, the diligent work as we continue to grow as a seminary. Thank you all. One of the board members, one of the faculty persons is Patricia Shaw and she has worked very hard in her class. I hear a lot of great comments on women in leadership and she will read our scripture for us this evening. The scripture will be Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, 
And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Dr. Takach, directors of the board of Grace Communion Seminary, faculty, and graduates. Today marks a milestone in our denomination as Grace Communion Seminary graduates its first class. As we, and we do so as an institution of higher learning, accredited by Distance Education and Training Council, which is recognized by the Council of Higher Education, Accreditation, and the United States Department of Education. As a denominational seminary, we seek to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In many ways, our seminary experience parallels the learning of the disciples in the first century, especially in the passage we've just heard. To set the context, Matthew 16 takes place in Caesarea Philippi in northern Galilee. Jesus reveals to his disciples that he is God's Messiah, and on this rock his ecclesia will be built. Then Jesus foretells his death and resurrection and called his disciples to deny themselves, to take up the cross, and to follow him. A most startling statement, given that crucifixion was a mark of terror in the day and a less than noble end to one identified as the Messiah. For these disciples, from the confession of faith to disbelief that this Christ must suffer and die, what kind of a hero is this? Six days pass, time for bewilderment to set in and to disrupt their neat theology of the Messiah. Jesus took three of them who would become leaders, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain to pray. Late in that day, tired from hiking, restful probably from prayer, but heavy with sleep, and now watching Jesus pray. They saw Jesus transfigured. His face, at night, shined like the sun, and his clothes shined bright with light. He was transformed. He was light. And in the aura of the transfiguration, they saw two men who appeared in glory talking with Jesus. And by their discussion, they could only be Moses and Elijah. Were these two heroes from old here to accompany the Messiah in vanquishing the Roman, uh, the Roman armies? Were Moses, Elijah, and Jesus bringing in the kingdom? The two men appeared in glory, and they talked about Jesus' departure. And Matthew uses the word exodus at that point. His departure soon to be accomplished in Jerusalem. The disciples, who had just been told of Jesus' impending death, must have heard echoes of the exodus. His incoming and incarnation was about to find its outgoing in crucifixion and resurrection. And in their glory, Moses and Elijah stood in close relationship with Jesus. Peter, undoubtedly searching for a response to the question posed by the situation, says it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles for the three of you. Peter felt the kingdom glory, for in that old covenant culture, tabernacles foreshadowed the kingdom. And it was in the tent of meeting that God came down to talk with Moses. But Peter's mistake is to place Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah, as if Jesus were merely human. While speaking, a bright, luminous cloud enveloped them as it swept the mountaintop. The figures of Jesus, Moses and Elijah, and those of Peter, James, and John were shrouded in the fog. Allusions back to Moses at Mount Sinai and Elijah at Mount Horeb hovered over the scene. For Moses, the giving of the Old Covenant, a covenant given in the freedom of God's grace, a covenant filled with cultic ritualism to point them toward the Messiah. For Elijah, 
in his meeting with God when Israel had forsaken God in the covenant. God was not to be found in the windstorm, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but in the quiet whisper, the breath that followed. For these three young Jewish men, the echo of God to Moses in Deuteronomy heralded the new covenant fulfilled in Jesus, foretold by Malachi in the forerunner of Elijah, all collectively to usher in the kingdom. Suddenly a voice is heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So some dawning to the scene comes to them. Fear grips them, though. The scene overwhelmed their understanding. It says that they fell on their faces. Once again, Jesus comforted them. Arise, do not be afraid. And they lifted their eyes, and they saw no one but Jesus. And then Jesus tells them, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. For the disciples, they had confirmation that Jesus was the Son of God and was now proclaimed as the prophet spoken of by Moses. Listen to him. And as they listened to him as they came off the mountain, they came to understanding that Elijah to come was John the Baptist. So in some sense, the kingdom was here in Jesus. In many ways, this is a seminary experience. Students and teachers working together to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. For all of us in seminary, it means to take one's present perspective and understanding, to pose questions about present and future realities, to broaden connections into other contexts, to look through another lens, to listen to mentors and evidence from 6,000 years of human history, to read the Church Fathers, to examine doctrinal heresies in order to articulate truth and to center one's service in the leadership of Jesus. This faith journey is especially true of seminary students. As a denomination, we have journeyed doctrinally into deeper understanding of the nature of God as love personified, as triune, one God who is always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The nature of Jesus Christ as fully human and fully divine, the nature of the new covenant as fully grace, as relational rather than transactional. All these changes have been important as we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. I believe one of the most significant changes, at least early changes, that was important in this process for our denomination lies in the deeper acceptance of the centrality of Jesus Christ not only in our lives, but in the lives of other Christians in other denominations and congregations. One of the early doctrinal changes led by Mr. Ducat Sr. was coming to the realization that we are but one denomination living in his love among many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Then in 1996, his son, Dr. Takach, offered a written apology for the Worldwide Church of God for, among other things, being judgmental and self-righteous, which had become so much a part of the exclusive nature of our teachings and our pursuit of holiness through old covenant obligations. In time, focus on Trinitarian theology and God's love in the Incarnation and the sending of the Holy Spirit broadened our appreciation for the life of Christ as he leads his universal body, the Church. As a seminary, we intend to help students live in our place in the body of Christ. In response to the centrality of Christ for all humanity, his sacrifice once and for all, objectively reaching out to every person and the Christian life and relationship with all who accept his gift. Trinitarian incarnational theology is first of all inclusive, for all are one in the singularity of Christ. It is upon this foundation that we enter theological debates on who God is and his relationship with creation. I had the opportunity a year ago to attend a celebration of the life of uh, Thomas Torrance. Father George Dragas, an Eastern Orthodox priest, spoke at the meetings in Chicago giving an address entitled, Thomas F. Torrance, an Eastern Orthodox Perspective. He was a student of Thomas Torrance, a friend of his for over 50 years. He had traveled as a student to Edinburgh to learn English and to become a monk. 
He learned, though, when he got there of this Dr. Torrance and decided to go to a lecture to check him out and found him to be quite orthodox, leaning as he did on Athanasius. Father Dragas, through his encounter, chose instead to study theology, to devote his life to that. His lecture was his thanks to his teacher and his friend. He quoted the 1974 prologue to Tom Torrance's text, Theology in Reconciliation. Here are the words of Tom Torrance. I mean, what would a final lecture be for graduates without a Tom Torrance quote, right? <laughs> Any theology which is faithful to the Church of Jesus Christ within which it takes place cannot but be a theology of reconciliation. For reconciliation belongs to the essential nature and the mission of the church in the world. By taking its rise from God's mighty acts in reconciling the world to himself in Christ, the church is constituted a community of the reconciled, and in being sent by Christ into the world to proclaim what God has done in him, the church is constituted a reconciling as well as a reconciled community. The task of theology is made more difficult, however, by the fact that although the church has been sent into the divided world in the service of reconciliation, it has allowed the divisions of the world to penetrate back into itself so that its own unity in mind and body has been damaged. And its mission of reconciliation in the world has been seriously impaired. It is incumbent upon theology, therefore, to find ways of overcoming disunity within the church as part of its service to reconciliation in the world, but also to come to grips with the div divisive forms of thought and life in human society wherever the church is planted and takes root, so that the children of God everywhere may share in the unity of the creation restored in the, in the incarnation of the word and the community of the reconciled in the church may become identical with all mankind. Christian theology is thus inescapably evangelical and ecumenical. As Father Dragas reflected on the passage, he put it this way, Christ does greater things through the united church through the Spirit, but the divided church mitigates these. Denominational churches each are prophetic voices within the one church. The Lord is a mediator of our world, not as a closed container, but an open world contingent upon God's love and grace. So, we reflect on the seminary experience in conclusion. In this seminary experience in Galilee that we read, seeing Jesus transfigured, a glimpse into the divinity of God, into the being of Jesus Christ. They now would walk the road of denial and doubt before coming to understand just how much everything, the law and the prophets, rested fully in Jesus Christ. In their graduation after the resurrection, they would continue their participation in the ministry of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus in the Spirit. Our graduates participate in Jesus, for in his vicarious humanity lay the full response to God's free grace. Jesus, revelator, mediator, reconciler, and redeemer. It is my pleasure to introduce the candidates for the Master of Pastoral Studies degree. Will the candidates for the Master's Degree, please stand. Based on the satisfactory completion of their course of study and the affirmation of their faculty and the approval of the Board of Directors, I present these candidates to you to receive the Master of Pastoral Studies degree. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors of Grace Communion Seminary and by the State of California to grant religious degrees, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Pastoral Studies, with the rights, honors, and privileges thereunto appertaining. In token thereof, I am pleased to present you with your diploma.
Dr. Dan Rogers and Dr. Joseph Tkach will be doing the hooding ceremony as part of the uh, master uh, conveying of the master uh, degree. Uh, first graduate is Samuel Mark Butler with a thesis entitled Church and Community, Staying Relevant in a Changing World. Bonnie Fay Fairchild. Persons of all races are included in God's plan to adopt humanity. William Foster Ford, Thomas F. Torrance and the Problem of Limited Atonement, Faith Seeking Understanding for a Pastor's Theology of Ministry. <laughs> John William Huffman III, an argument against the teachings of the immortal soul. Carl Martin Reinigel, the role of encouragement in pastoral ministry. Michael Vance Swaggerty, Church Growth in America, whose responsibility is it? Next in alphabetical order would be Mervyn Anthony Walton, Ethics in the Prison Epistles. Uh, he came to California a month ago and we were able to give him his diploma there. We were a little ahead of time, but that was our opportunity. <laughs> <clears throat> Kenneth Howard Williams, Marriage is Good, but is it a sacrament?
Well, now it's time for, as Dr. Duke said, my remarks and a commissioning prayer. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement for us to have done this in three years, become accredited and produce a graduating class. So there are many to be thanked, as Dr. Duke already extended those uh, thankfulnesses. But uh, I want to extend my thanks, and please join me in doing so, to Dr. Duke, as well as Dr. Morrison and Susan Earle, the registrar. I saw the work they did. In fact, Susan Earle, I think, slayed a few forests, a few dragons in printers, to produce all the written material that was necessary for the accreditation committee. So please join me in extending a hearty thankfulness to them. During the accreditation visit, I took my turn to be interviewed by two of the accrediting, accreditation team, and they interviewed me for approximately 25 minutes, uh, perhaps a few minutes more, and they went through their series of questions about finances and our, our policies and procedures, and, and then when they were all done, the two of them said, you know what? you got a great program here. You ought to offer more stuff. I took that as a good sign. <laughs> so at this point, I do want to pray and ask God to commission them. So if you would all join me in that prayer. Father, we come again prayerfully into your brilliance. We've acknowledged this afternoon not just academic achievement. Of course, that is a good thing, too. But this is much, much more with these brothers and sisters who have fulfilled the requirements for this master's degree. We now ask, Father, that you would commission them to a greater effort in ministry with Jesus through your spirit. We thank you, our loving Father, for their commitment to, to excellence. We thank you for their families who've been supportive and have sacrificed. And now as they have finished this course and this degree program, we ask that they continue as your ambassadors of light and of love and of life May we all work closer together, and we ask this in the same name that we were all baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming until 2016. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen? Amen. Thank you.